All right. Um, just mute your mic. Mute your mic unless you're going to talk, okay? Because I'm getting a lot of feedback. Yep. All right. Um, this is a combination of sealed system talk as well as uh, refrigeration and air conditioning because those of you that are taking your EPA license type 2 has to do with uh, like central air conditioning type equipment. So I'm sort of like joining the two together. We're going to talk a little bit about the components of these systems and we're also going to talk about uh, overcharged units and what is an overcharge, what to look for, and so forth. So, you know, we talked about restrictions in the system, but now let's talk about overcharges. And let's also do a little comparison of residential refrigerators to air conditioning units, because when you learn a refrigeration system, even though it's called an air conditioner, it's still a refrigeration system. And I wanted to show you how well these two compare to each other because if you learn to work on one and learn to use the tools, learn to use your gauges, learn to use your temperature pressure charts and, and, and other things like that, you're going to find out that you can work on refrigerators and you can work on central air too. Um, it, there's nothing that's going to stop you there. Um, the first thing that I want to do is um, I'll get my little uh, uh, symbol uh, tools here and Let's see, where's my drawing tools, my shapes. Here we go. Um, and with, with the shape tools, I want to draw a line from one component to the next because you guys are familiar with this picture here on the right, right? Yes, maybe. And if you look, we have an evaporator here. G said you can't see the entire screen. Who can't see the entire screen? Richard. Well, can you uh, guys, gee, can you guys you can. all see the screen? Uh, yeah, I can. If if you can, then there's something that's in her settings that are different. Um, I have no control over how she sees it. Um, so she just left. You might come back. She might, re but she can come in without me letting her. Okay, so let's take a look at this. You're familiar with this evaporator yeah. and the evaporator fan. Um, now, if you look, this here is the evaporator of an air conditioning system. This is what we call the air handler inside the AC system. And this is what's inside of your closet in your home. And it has an evaporator. And then it also has a evaporator fan or blower fan. Um, Pedro just came in. So if you take a look, an air conditioning system is very similar to that of a house refrigerator. You have an evaporator, which are these two here, and then you have a fan that circulates air across the evaporator. Now this is located inside the refrigerator and circulates the air inside the refrigerator, and this part's located inside the house and circulates the air inside the house. The only difference with the unit on the left is if you look at the top, there's some controls and electrical. That's an electric heating element, it looks like. And it also has the wiring and the controls that turn it on. But the air handler is the same as the part inside your refrigerator. So I have a video here I'd like you to, to see for a minute, and, and then we'll move on. I'll just give it a second to load. I didn't think it would be that slow. Standard air handler is a piece of equipment used in some split air conditioning and heat pump systems, specifically ducted forced air systems that do not include a gas, propane, or oil-fired furnace. So you'll either have one of those types of furnaces or an all-electric air handler. You can see here, they install in the ductwork, much like a furnace would. Here's a picture of a closet. Uh, Connections the for the line set, where the refrigerant travels through the, the line set from that outdoor condensing unit or heat pump. Okay, uh, take a look. What he's calling the line set, which are these two lines right here, 
Um, what are they similar to in a refrigerator? This goes to the unit outside. So the Freon comes in and out of this uh, piece of equipment. What is behind this panel? Can you answer any of those questions? Anyone? An evaporator? There, yes, it's, a compressor, maybe? It, it's an evaporator. This is the piece inside the house. Oh, uh, hey. So what are the two lines that go to an evaporator and a refrigerator? It's got a single name. Two words. It's got a no, high heat pressure, low pressure. No. Go ahead, son, Greg. Condenser? No. Um, I say the condenser? No, it's not the condenser. These two lines, which run out to the condenser, are very similar to what we call the heat exchanger in a refrigerator. What two parts make up a heat exchanger? That is the capillary tube and the suction, suction and capillary. line. It's the, it's the capillary tube and the suction line. So in this case, it, the larger one of the two is the suction line. And instead of the other one being called a capillary tube, in air conditioning, they call it a liquid line. Well, they call it a liquid line because the refrigerant is 100% liquid in that tube. And that's the same thing in a capillary. When the refrigerant's in the capillary, it's 100% liquid refrigerant. That's after it leaves the condenser. So let's take a look again. Like I tried to do is show you comparisons of the system and also go over the system. Into the air handler inside. There's also the drain connections for the condensation that's created by... So just like when a refrigerator goes into defrost, in a refrigerator it has a drain pan with a hole that runs the water to the compressor so it can evaporate that water, and that's these lines here. Now, in an air conditioning system, it doesn't get cold enough to make ice, but it does remove humidity and moisture from the air, which runs into a drain pan that is usually either sent through a PVC pipe out of the house to drip outside of the home, or to what we call a condensate pump, which is just a little tank with a pump on it. And when enough water gets inside, it hits a float and the pump throws the water out. So it drips water and has a drain pan just like a refrigerator. The air handler when it's cooling. Here are the knockouts and there's another. Now I'm just going to go a little bit farther. I have it sitting. The evaporator coil that comes factory installed in any air handler. The refrigerant travels through those ports from the line set connection from outdoors, and that flows through the evaporator coil. Your home's air passes across it, cooling, or in heat pump applications, heating as well, that home's air. You can also see the drain pans where the condensation that's pulled out of the home is, is collected and drained off. This particular model can also be installed horizontally, so the drain pan runs up the side as well. So there's a drain pan at the bottom. It's hard to see in that blue, but there's the holes there. But you can lay this unit on its side, like up in an attic or something, and knock out one of these knockouts and have the drain run out of this pan instead of the bottom pan that you see here. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out, that those two holes that he said were lines coming in, if you look at these lines down here, they're very similar to your capillary tube and run to one of those pipes, which is the inlet, and it comes in here and goes through the evaporator, and then the lines all at the top run back to a single pipe, which is where your suction line is. So it's very similar to an evaporator of a residential refrigerator, but it, there's more capillary tubes because they break the evaporator up into multiple little evaporator parts at a time. Well, it's in an L shape. gives you more flexibility in the installation. Here's the blower for the air handler. They come in multi-speed or the fancier variable speed models to meet your needs. And then we have the electrical connection. Okay, the blower is the fan, very similar to an evaporator fan in a refrigerator. So again, all I'm trying to do is to give you the comparison between an air conditioner and a refrigerator. And if you're able to identify the components and you know how a sealed system works, you should be able to work on some, this kind of product too. So I'm going to stop this video here, and if you guys want to watch it later, you can, but I have some other videos and other things I want to go over. So the blower is the same as the evaporator fan, and the evaporator is the same as the evaporator in the air handler. So um, let's move on.
Let's talk about two words that are going to be on the EPA test, but also how they relate to the refrigerant system. Because when you're working on an air conditioner or refrigeration system, uh, sometimes you need to know what the superheat is or something called subcooling. We're first going to talk about superheat. Superheat says, let's start with superheat. Boiling is when a liquid gains heat and transforms into a vapor. So if you take water and you put it on the stove and it starts to boil, it turns from a liquid to a steam or a vapor. Superheat occurs when that vapor is heated above its boiling point. What does that mean? Does anybody have an idea what that means when it says superheat is when the vapor is above its boiling point? Like when the water uh, cinches, like, you know, like on a really hot pan, maybe? Uh, no, but what temperature, does, what temperature does water boil? 212 Is it 200 degrees? degrees, I think. 212. 212 degrees 212. Fahrenheit. So if water boils okay. at 212, at 215 or 230 degrees steam. It just instantly evaporates. Well, at anything above 212 degrees becomes superheat. So if you got 215, 230, 300 degrees, that's what we're talking about superheat. Okay, where it is above the boiling point, which is 212. So superheat is critical in HVAC because it ensures that liquid refrigerant is boiled off before it leaves the evaporator and heads to the compressor. So if you look here, this is an example of an evaporator here. And they're taking a temperature of the suction line. This right here on the bottom is the suction line. And this is what goes to the compressor. So if I uh, draw a line here going this way, I'm going to put going to the compressor. I'm just going to abbreviate it to comp because it's not easy to write with a mouse. It goes to the compressor, and this is the suction line. All right. Now, oops, let's just do that. Okay, suction line. Um, now, this here, instead of a capillary tube, they use something called a TXV, and this is also something in your EPA, thermostatic expansion valve. What happens is this is the liquid line or the capillary tube that comes into the evaporator. And instead of a capillary tube, they use a liquid line. They go into a valve that manually opens and closes to control the pressure coming into the evaporator. Um, so what happens here is you measure the pressure at the entrance of the evaporator and you get its pressure. Then what happens is we take that pressure and the type of gas, let's say example 134A, and we use the temperature pressure chart and that's where they get that 30 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm not sure 100% which gas they're using in this, but if we went to the chart and said, 30 degrees Fahrenheit, whichever gas, which was about 55 degrees, would be the gas that they're talking about. So in order to get what they call what is the superheat of the unit, let's go through the steps here. Attach your low side suction refrigerant gauge to the suction line service point at the condenser coil. So the condenser is outside. And this bottom line here is where they want you to put your gauge, and that's what they have right here. So they said, put a gauge on here, and you can identify the suction line because it's larger of the two refrigerant lines. Same thing like a heat exchanger, capillary tube, and a suction line. Place a clamp on digital meter probe near the suction line inlet to the condenser coil, somewhere near the service port. So if you can see here, they took a meter and they attached it to the pipe and they're actually measuring the temperature of the pipe, which is telling us the suction line temperature. In this case, it's 40 degrees, and they put it here in this math problem right here. Now, read and record the pressure and corresponding temperature from your low side gauge. For example, 130 PSI at 410A, which is used for air conditioners now, is about 44 degrees Fahrenheit. 44 is the saturation temperature of the refrigerant in the evaporator coil. 
So in other words, at 54.9, whatever refrigerant they have here, it's 30 degrees Fahrenheit. And so they took the pressure, used a temperature chart to get the 30, and they put that 30 down here. So now they say you subtract this number from that number and you get a superheat of 10 degrees. So read and record the temperature from your digital temperature probe. Example, use 54. Subtract the temperature recorded from your gauges from the digital temperature reading. This example shows that the refrigerant entering the condenser is 10 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than the saturation temperature refrigerant. So they're saying that the, the temperature coming in is 10 degrees warmer than, than, I'm sorry, the temperature going out is more warmer than the temperature coming in. That is what we measure in superheat. Now on the, on the air handler, on that unit that we saw in the video, a lot of them have a chart and they said if you have this temperature and this suction line temperature and you have this much superheat, this unit at this temperature and this pressure should give you this much superheat. And that's a way of measuring whether the unit has a full charge of Freon. We were talking about restrictions the other day and we talked about putting a gauge on it and just reading the pressure. But some of these compressors in these newer units have variable speed compressors. The same thing with a refrigerator. Some of these compressors are variable speed. You can't just look at a pressure gauge and say, oh, I'm low on Freon, or oh, it has too much Freon, because it all depends on how fast that compressor is running and how fast it's pumping the Freon. So measuring superheat or subcooling is a more accurate way to tell if this unit is properly charged. It's more important for technicians when they do air conditioning setups because when they work on air conditioners, and I'm going to move to a picture here real quick, when you install an air conditioning system into a house, the condensing unit's outside and the air handler's inside. And this also works for the EPA. The, the length of the lines, if they were right out, outside the wall from each other, the lines aren't very long. But if I took that air handler and put it up here on the second floor, I have to run the lines all the way up and into this unit. The lines are longer between the two. So to have the unit properly charged, I can't go by pressures. I have to go by superheat and see if it's charged properly. So superheat is a term that air conditioning technicians use a lot, and you have to know how to measure it. So that right there was a way to measure, or I gotta go back a little bit further, a way to measure superheat. So you take the pressure going into the evaporator, you turn that to temperature, you take the temperature of the line coming out of the evaporator, and you subtract those two, the higher from the lower, and you get a 10 degree superheat. I, I sort of said higher from lower, but actually the suction line, you're going to subtract the inlet from the suction. So that's superheat. Let's take a look at condensing units. Central air conditioner has a condensing unit like a refrigerator. Let's start with our residential refrigerator. And if you can see right here, we have our compressor. And if you look in the back is our condenser here. And then we have a fan that circulates the air over the compressor and the condenser. If we look at this unit above here, this is part of a refrigeration unit. We talked a little bit about it the other day. That's the same thing as a walk-in cooler. You have a compressor, you have a condenser, and you have a fan, and your lines connect here. Same thing as your compressor, your condenser, and your fan here. Now, if we look at a central air to the left, this red unit right here is our compressor. These coils you can see on this side and this side is our condenser. And then on the top, it's a little hard to see, there's a fan that's blowing the air up and out with a condenser fan. So an air conditioning system, the components are very similar to the uh, refrigerator. Um, now let's talk a little bit about subcooling. Superheating was measured on the line coming in and out of the evaporator. In this case, we're measuring this on the condenser. 
Let's take a look at how to measure subcooling and what is subcooling. We measure the liquid line temperature of the device. The liquid line is the pipe that carries the refrigerant from the condensing coil to the expansion valve. Um, so the liquid line is the same as a capillary tube. Okay. The measure to measure the temperature, strap the thermometer's probe on the liquid line approximately six inches from the expansion valve. So if we look here, we have our temperature probe and they put it right here. Does anybody know what this unit is here? It's also a player position on a football team that starts with an R. Receiver? That's it. It's a receiver. The receiver is usually after the condenser and helps catch oil um, coming out of the condenser that may be flowing throughout the system. So this here is the receiver coming out of the condenser and then this would go to your expansion valve. Okay, so the freon's flowing this way into the condenser here and out the receiver here. My arrows are horrible, sorry. So freon's flowing that way. Now measure the liquid line pressure of the device. To do this, connect the pressure gauge to both the suction and liquid service valves. That didn't make no sense. If you're getting subcooling, you do not need to connect to the low side of the system. They want you to connect to the high side of the system here. Okay? Now, once you do that, you wait for like 10 minutes of the unit running to make sure we've achieved proper temperatures and pressures throughout the system. The pressure, the pressure gauge should show the results in pounds per square inch. So they're talking about this gauge here is reading the high side pressure coming off the condenser. Convert the liquid line pressure to the condensing temperature, also called saturation temperature. So what they're doing is they're taking, take that pressure and convert it to uh, the temperature of the refrigerant inside the system, which is 105 degrees Fahrenheit. The actual conversion will depend on the type of refrigerant being used. Uh, the product's temperature pressure chart will provide you a specific condensing temperature. Subtract the liquid line temperature from the condensing temperature, and that difference is called subcooling. So what we're talking about is measure the pressure here, take that pressure, go to your chart, which is 135, and that goes to 105 degrees, and that's how we got the first one. Then we have this meter here measuring the temperature of the pipe. So it's a thermistor, guys. And they use a Velcro or a piece of electrical tape, and they tape it to the pipe, and they measure the temperature of that line, in this case, 95 degrees, and that's how they got this number, and they subtract this from this, and now I got 10 degrees Fahrenheit subcooling. This is another method for determining proper charge of the system. You can go by superheat, or you can go by subcooling. Superheat is on the evaporator, and we're going to find superheat, on the suction line. Subcooling's on the condenser, and we're going to find that on the what line? What line runs with the suction line? Starts on an L. Nobody knows. It's right here. The liquid line. Okay, guys. We're measuring the temperature on the liquid line. Okay, I know it's it's like talking another language to you guys, but this is also going on in the refrigerator. We don't talk about superheat and subcooling, and the reason is when you buy a refrigerator, the manufacturer already determined the math on here and said, in order for this refrigerator to work properly, we have to have the tubing this size and a compressor this size, and when we charge the system, it takes 3.5 ounces, and that's a properly charged system. We don't need to measure superheat or subcooling, but we can. And measuring superheat and subcooling on a system will also help you, help you know if the pressures are correct. So we were talking about restrictions 
or we're talking about overcharge or undercharge, we'll do overcharging today. This is another method to determine if this system is properly charged. Okay? So let's take a look at what video I have here. I go back to the beginning. Measuring subcooling. Subcooling. All right, we have the gauges hooked up. The uh, temperature probe is clamped on to the high side liquid. Also, the liquid line. You can't really see it too well, but it's behind the suction line where the blue hose is connected. If you see the red hose is connected to this side, the line right here and measuring the, blue hose the is temperature to that, of the, to the low side. refrigeration piping right here as it leaves the condenser. And if you remember from our lessons that we don't use our gauges so much to measure pressure as we use it to determine what the saturation temperature is of the refrigerant. So first, let's take a look at the high side gauge. This is uh, actually a Lennox system with a TXV, so we're gonna be measuring subcooling today. All right, here's our high side pressure gauge. What you're gonna to wanna to look at is how the the indicator and where it crosses the pink ring so you can read the saturation temperature of okay he's using a lot of big words and I want you guys to start learning these words that pink and green area what are those numbers what are what are they actually telling you anybody know what these what these numbers inside of your gauges read pressure no these these are our temperatures here I think this 24320 is the pressure I don't know if it, I think this one's the pressure or this one's the pressure I think I think it's this one here might be the might be the pressure the inside one it might be a 410a unit and then at this pressure it's about 93 degrees and he's going to explain it to you so he's taking the pressure and he's converting it to temperature and you can use your gauges to do that as long as your gauges have the right refrigerant. The reason why they're those colors is because that's the color of the refrigerant tank for that type of gas. So the green on the inside is probably R22 and this one here is probably 410A. Okay, so now he's telling you, you hook this up to the high side you get the high side pressure, and then you come here and you find out what the high side temperature is. And he's calling it a saturation temperature. The refrigerant. So it's crossing at about 93, 94 degrees. Can you see that? Right there. The way that we measure our subcooling is taking the saturation temperature as indicated by our gauge which was 92 93 degrees and from that we subtract the temperature of the refrigeration pipe the high side line so he's saying you take this pressure you figure out what the temperature is and that's that and then this meter is where the thermistors taped to the outside of the liquid line or what you would call the capillary tube measuring the temperature of the tube and if this is 93 and this is 83 what is my subcooling temperature you subtract this from this so 93 take away 83 gives you how much anybody can do math 93 minus 83 yeah, it's a subcooling of 10 degrees. And we subtract that temperature from our saturation temperature. So let's say that's 93 degrees minus 83 degrees gives us 10 degrees of subcooling. Now, when you have subcooling and you have proper subcooling levels, which this is, it indicates that the, refri the refrigerant has now condensed back down into liquid that there's no vapor and we have a solid column of liquid going back to the evaporator coil through the metering device 
So once again, subcooling, we measure the saturation temperature as indicated on the gauge, and from that we subtract the actual physical temperature of the high side refrigeration line to get the subcooling. All right, so that is how you measure the subcooling. Now, if you go back to the interactive. Okay, so that was subcooling. So let's move on. Refrigerators that are overcharged. What are, anybody know what we're looking at here in this picture? A dusty compressor. A dusty compressor, but what else do you see? <laughs> uh, I mean, the frosted too, obviously. Do you know what line that is? Oh, yeah. That is the suction line. That is the suction line coming from a compressor. Now let's talk. Let's talk about it because one of your assigned system. It's an easy mistake to put too much refrigerant into a system because the vast array of different systems on the market today. Also, many systems for other system problems look similar, but are not exactly like an overcharge. The system described here is that that is an overcharged is a low temperature commercial refrigeration system with a thermostatic expansion valve metering device with a receiver. The refrigerant is R134A. So we're just giving you all these numbers. I'm not going to read all these numbers to you, but you're telling you the temperatures and pressures. But what I want to look at is the symptoms here. Symptoms of this overcharge system include high discharge temperature. So what makes, why do you think a high discharge temperature would be evident if it was overcharged? So they're saying here as a definition, the overcharged system and a discharge temperature of 240 degrees is caused by the high compression ratio. So what they mean is that you got more freon than the compressor is designed to handle, so it's going to raise the pressure on the high side of the system. Okay, Liquid backed up in the condenser will flood some of the condensing surface area, causing high, press, high head pressures. So what happens is, Compressor cannot pump liquid, it pumps vapor. As it flows through the condenser, it turns to a liquid as it's leaving the condenser. If you have more Freon in that condenser than it's designed to hold, you're going to have more liquid in that condenser. The more liquid you have, the smaller space you have for the vapor refrigerant, which increases the pressure within the condenser. So all of the heat being absorbed in the evaporator and the suction line, along with the motor heat and high heat of the compression from the high compression ratio, has to be rejected into a smaller condenser because the backed up of liquid. So in other words, too much liquid in there doesn't allow the condenser dissipating heat like it's supposed to. So this creates high condenser subcooling. Remember we said a 10 degree subcool. So if, if you have a higher temperature or pressure on the condenser, you're going to have a higher subcool uh, temperature difference. And they don't give us an example here. But they're also saying that the high condensing pressures, subcool liquid backed up in the condenser will cause reduced condensing surface area. So let's take a look back at that uh, chart real quick about subcooling and explain what are they talking about. So here's the condenser. If you see the different colors, that this is just real light faded and it starts changing color. Now they got dots. These dots here versus the solid color above. The solid color is the vapid refri vapor refrigerant. This is supposed to be the compressor right here. So it's vapor, high pressure vapor. And as it's releasing heat, it's starting to change color. And as it releases more heat, it starts here to start converting to a liquid. So the dots are like the liquid and, and, and the solid color behind it is the vapor. As we go halfway through the condenser, it started to get thicker and thicker 
where now we're getting to almost 100% liquid, but if it's overcharged, the liquid may be this far back and the dots may be this far back. So we don't want to overcharge a system. But what happens in overcharging the system, we raise this pressure right here. By raising this pressure, that raises this temperature. Now, if the outside line temperature is still 95, and I move this temperature to 115, 115 take away 95 now leaves a subcooling of 20 degrees. So that's what they're saying. If the high side pressure goes up, and this temperature doesn't change too much here because it's still measuring the, the saturated liquid, then you're going to have a, a 20 degree subcool instead of a 10 degree subcool like they're showing here. So a system that is overcharged would show you a higher subcooling difference. So let's move on a little bit more. The symptoms of a refrigerant overcharge. The higher head pressures of an overcharged system will have the tendency to overfeed the evaporator. Now what that means is that if it's overcharged, you might put too much liquid refrigerant in the evaporator as well, thus decreasing the superheat. So now the superheat went up on your high side, and I'm sorry, the subcooling went up on the high side, and your superheat went down on the low side, and that is an indication of overcharge. Now, how, what does that mean, super? heat went down. Well, when that suction line is frozen like that, when the suction line is frozen here, our meter here, instead of saying 40 degrees, let's say it says 30 degrees. Well, if it's 30 degrees here instead of um, 40, and it's 30 degrees here, instead of a 10 degree superheat, we have zero degree superheat. So that means there's too much freon in that pipe. It's supposed to be all vapor there, and it should have a specific temperature. But if it has liquid refrigerant there, the temperature drops because it's still freezing, like you see in this picture here. So you still see this freezing. This means Freon is still turning from a liquid to a vapor when frost is appearing on the line. Just like when we talked about a restriction, it turned... In a, in a low charge system like this here, like this, where the ice is, is where it turned to vapor. Now there's no ice down here, so it's 100% vapor down here. Well, this is just the opposite. We still have liquid in here turning to vapor, and if we're not careful, liquid refrigerant is going to enter the compressor here, and that means it might be overcharged. Now, it's not 100% overcharged until we discuss a few more things. Overcharged cap tube system. Now, this is what we deal with on a refrigerator, a cap tube system versus an air conditioning system, and we're measuring superheat. For dealing with a capillary tube metering device, the same symptoms occur with the exception of the evaporator superheat. Remember, capillary tube systems are critically charged to prevent floodback of refrigerant to the compressor during low evaporator loads. And a low evaporator load means when the, when the temperature is really, really cold inside the box and there's not enough heat going over the evaporator, the capillary tube is set in a way where it tries not to let liquid refrigerant enter the compressor. The higher the head pressures of an overcharged system will have the tendency to overfeed the evaporator, thus decreasing the superheat. And again, if you have too much liquid refrigerant in your suction line, your superheat drops. If the system is overcharged more than 10%, liquid can enter the suction line and get into the suction valves or the crankcase of the compressor. This will cause compressor damage and eventually a failure. Compressors cannot compress liquid. They can bend valves. They could damage the piston or the crankshaft inside the compressor if they're overcharged. So if you're working on a system and you see back there the suction line is frozen up, the one key thing we want to look for is look what's right here hiding in the corner. What do we have right here?
Anybody know what that is? Are y'all still with me? One moment, I'm trying to... That's a bullet valve. That's a bullet valve that they use to charge the system. So if you see an overcharge, you want to look for indication that someone did a sealed system job before you because it is very rare that a system is overcharged from the factory. Someone might have worked on it and charged that system. And in this case, you can see a valve that was added to the system, and that's probably why it was overcharged. Now, this valve looks like it might be added to a process stub, and I think it's this line right here. It's a little hard to tell. Um, this line looks like the discharge line, and it runs to the steel pipe here. This valve might be on this line right running on the bottom, which is a process stub. But it's very hard to tell with that dryer filter in its way, whether it's connected there or to the high side line behind it. So let's take a look at an evaporator coil in an air conditioning system. Well, what, what does it look like we have here? Anybody know? Overcharge. It may look like an overcharge. <laughs> but oh, I thought too when you when it freezes up like that, you uh, don't, don't you have to change the filter? It, you want you probably want to change the AC filter, but it is very possible that the coils, the evaporator coils here, and there's one here and another one going at this angle here. The air, the fan is usually on the top here, and it's pulling the air up in the inside and then coming out through the coils on the sides here. And there may be a lot of dirt, and the only way to find it is take out the filter, lay it down on the ground, and take a flashlight and look up in there so you can see the inside of the evaporator coil. If you see, this is a suction line coming to the condensing unit outside the house. And if evaporator is that frosted up, what happens now is as ice builds on the evaporator, less heat is running through those coils. The ice is blocking the airflow. And when the ice blocks the airflow, you have a flooding of an evaporator, and you're going to cause the evaporator temperature to drop below freezing. Normally, an air conditioner evaporator runs about 36 degrees just above freezing so it doesn't ice up. If you see ice up, that means the temperature dropped below. You could have a freezing up evaporator if it's low on Freon, but nine out of 10 times air conditioners are usually dirty and not pulling enough heat across the coil to melt all that ice and raise that temperature of that evaporator. So if we look here, I got a picture of the suction line because now, just like that refrigerator suction line, this suction line, which is going back to the compressor here outside the customer's home, is starting to freeze up as well. So before you go and say, oh, I have an overcharge, we need to look and make sure that we don't have a blocked airflow over the evaporator. Now, why is that important, and how does that relate to a refrigerator? Well, in some refrigerators, if the evaporator fan is not working in the customer's refrigerator, it could cause a similar problem to a dirty evaporator coil. You're not pulling enough air across it, so now you're building up excessive ice on that evaporator. Okay? So a bad fan motor could be very similar to a dirty evaporator coil. So we already talked about this picture here about how the units were split. Look at this picture right here. This is a dirty evaporator coil and after it has been cleaned. If you look at this picture here, this is when someone probably didn't change their filter or they're running their air conditioner without a filter. And I think only this portion right here on the unit has enough space for air to flow it in. The rest of it looks like it's almost completely blocked. So that could block your airflow. Now look at this evaporator here. Do you have an idea what that is? Anybody work on an air conditioning unit before? 
Well, that's a dirty coil, but the white stuff is coil cleaner. What happens is a technician will do something called a pump down and trap all the refrigerant in the condenser by, by some valves on the unit outside. And then they'll remove the evaporator and take it outside, tape up those Freon lines, and they'll spray a coil cleaner. Almost right here, you could see a little bit of the evaporator <laughs> coil peeking through. You're muted, Z. What? What'd you say? Okay, I didn't hear you. Um, but you can see a little bit of the evaporator coil peeking through here and here. But they spray this coil cleaner, and the coil chemically reacts with the algae and mold that's inside of your unit. And it'll actually put heat out. So you Richard, got to hear... we cannot hear you. What? You can't hear me? Can anybody else hear me? I think he lost the signal. He may be frozen. I'm frozen. Oh, good lord! <laughs> no, he's still I there. I texted him. He, he's, he's lost. There. Yeah, he's check check your Google. Check your Google. Unmute yourself on Google Hangouts. I'm here. There you go. But why was it? Why wasn't it working? Right. Unmute yourself. Hover over the bottom. There you go. Oh. I don't know what happened. Almost there. Got, there you go. Okay, so let's go back to the presentation. So, if we look at this evaporator, what I was circulating here, well, circle, circling here, was you can actually see a little bit of the evaporator sticking through. Coil cleaner that's used on an air conditioning unit gets inside and foams up and pulls the dirt out of an air conditioning unit. Some people charge between two and three hundred and fifty dollars, maybe even four hundred dollars to do a coil clean. It takes about forty five minutes to pull this coil out, spray some cleaner on it, hose it down, put it back in, charge it back up, and you're on your way. You only have to braze two joints. So when it's dirty like this, you want to spray some coil cleaner on it because even though it looks like it's on the outside, that dirt got in between the coils. Those coils will be wet with humidity, and the dirt will stick to those coils. So let's take a look real quick at a video I have here. I'll fast forward just a little bit. So you see here, the guy's spraying. Uh, I would really wouldn't use a pressure washer. He's using something like a pressure washer. And if you're not careful, the too high a pressure, you'll bend those fins. But the coil cleaner is inside of that container, and it's forcing the dirt out. So basically, he's doing a coil clean with this unit. Now let's go the to following the actual video. video is brought to you by was, Yellow Jacket. Uh, uh, Visit yellowjacket.com to find out why Yellow Jacket is the industry standard. I did. I'll try to make this one a little better. I will, uh, it's stewing right now, foaming up real good. I'll sh get you some shots of rinsing it. And now it would have been nice if he started the video just before he put the coil cleaner on it. But the coil was very dirty. He sprayed the cleaner on it. Sometimes you spray a little bit of water on it, then spray the cleaner on it. And then it starts to foam up like this, and it's pulling the dirt out, as you can see it. The after. And uh, then we'll put it back in place. Make two swages, braise them up, and uh, start a vacuum. So look at him washing the dirt right off. Like I said, you can make three to $500 doing this job. And this is the same thing as doing a shield system job in a refrigerator. That's why you want to get your EPA license. Universal. Now, one thing that I don't like that he's doing, I want to point something out. Uh, let me just zoom back a little bit. You see he's pouring the water into the coil like this. 
that's all good, but the air is flowing that way when the air conditioner is running. The air is coming in through here and coming out the other side. A majority of the dirt is going to be on this side of the evaporator. The other side of the evaporator may be dirty, but he's trying to force the dirt in through the coil. I would spray the coil cleaner on the inside like this, but I'd stand it up the other way. Right now it's like shaped like a V. I would turn it over where it's shaped like an A where the point is at the top and holes from the outside in trying to wash all the dirt out. Then if I can't get it all out, I would then wash from the inside like he's doing now. But he's the way he's doing it, he's almost forcing dirt in deeper into the coil and it may get lodged in there, may not come out the other side. So if the dirt, if the air is flowing in this way, most of the dirt is going to be on this side. So let's flow the water from the outside and push the dirt out the opposite way it came in. So let me just zoom out a little bit more. Now, if you look here, these are your two lines, your liquid line and your suction line. You see how he taped it up. Uh, I wouldn't put too much tape. I like to take a plastic bag, wrap it around the pipe, and then tape it up. The only reason why is because you have to solder them back together with a torch, and the glue sometimes from your tape will, will mess up the pipe, and you have to clean it really, really good. If you put a bag over it, then tape it so water don't get in. It works just as good, and there's less cleaning of the tape off the pipes. So what he's trying to prevent here is water from getting into the lines as he's cleaning the evaporator. Look how clean that thing is now. So now he flips it over here. I would start washing this way first, from the top down, then wash it the other way after. Now it's never going to look perfect, but look here. I want to show you something when he flips it over. Much, much better. Now I'm not saying he did it, but some of these metal fins almost look like they're bent over, if you look. And if they're bent, like here, this is all bent. You see these lines? You can see in between the grooves, but you can't see them here. The airflow is blocked. They have a tool called a fin comb that goes in between these blades and straightens them out. If you don't straighten them out, He's lost a good percentage of cooling here. He must have lost about 10, 50% of the evaporator. And that could be either too much pressure from the hose or he tried to use a rag or something and wipe it clean. And you got to be careful not to bend the aluminum on these fins. Still a little more dirt. Like I said, I would have pushed it out the other way. And so that's how you clean an AC coil. You take it out and you clean it. So I'm not going to get any further into that. So cleaning kind of condenser coils. So if you got dirty evaporator, you can have dirty condenser coils. Look at this refrigerator condenser coil. It could be dirty from dust, dog hair, cat hair. You have to clean them sometimes. What would happen if the condenser is dirty? It will not effectively dissipate the heat. It doesn't dissipate the heat. So what do you think happens to the subcooling? Does it go up or go down? If it can't get rid of the heat. Well, if the pressure goes up, the temperature is going to go up. So you might increase your subcooling. You might be too high of subcooling. So this here is not good. We need to dissipate the heat in order to clean these coils. So here's make a guy sure removing the drain line, which is coming Couple from the evaporator, keep in, running keep in down into this pan. First of all, make sure your refrigerator is unplugged. Secondly, 
Uh, these copper lines have refrigerant running through them. So don't torque on these or bend them. Work around them. Be gentle with those. The tools that you'll need for this job could vary. Uh, things that I found that work well is Shrek's toothbrush. That's seen some mileage. For this particular style of fridge, I really like New Calgon, New Blast, 4290-75. Uh, be ready, because it costs about 30 bucks a can. It's not cheap, but it does get to all the nooks and crannies. There's actually several different layers to this condenser coil. Oh, wait here. You'll see that if you clear back this dust, you can see there's dust under the dust. So there's actually several different layers to this condenser coil. There's also a back side, it's, it's round. So another tool that I found that works really well is one of these brushes that's... It looks like something called a bottle brush, but it's called a coil brush. You can buy them for just a couple of bucks on Amazon. And it works well on most condenser coils. This is probably the most difficult condenser coil to clean. This is GE's version of a condenser coil. Where the other ones are usually flat and folded over, but you can get in and out of them with this coil brush just by going backwards and forwards. These round ones here make it very difficult. The only way to really get in between all of them is on the left side here, there's a condenser fan that's mounted to it in this plastic housing on the end. And if you remove the fan, you can get the coil brush in between. It's designed for cleaning out lint from your dryer. Reason being... So let's shape um, and it's very important because this is where your refrigerator bleeds off its heat so if this is dirty as it is it will run the compressor for much longer than it has to and it shortens the life of your refrigerator let's get started first thing we're going to do is remove the defrost drain line that's this tube that's bent again i'm going to fast forward so we're not and sitting here watching videos straight. all day which is covered with junk. And we'll so first thing he does is he starts cleaning what's loose off the top. You can see ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure with this particular job. Now this guy's fast. I need about 10 of these employees. <laughs> So now he's getting the top of the condenser if he can. Okay, so once you've got as much as you can off with the brushes, and that's quite a lot. I'm gonna take my condenser spray I'm going to change the camera angle just a bit so I don't hit the camera with this uh, nasty smelling goodness. It says it's a pleasant citrus scent. Far away it smells good. Up close it's repugnant. So all I'm going to do is spray uh, this new blast on this coil. Look how clean that is. And there, you see it does a really good job. Gets to the second, third layer, if there is one, and knocks the majority of the dust off. If you're I think instead of buying that $30 bottle, since that condenser is sitting right over top of a drain pan, you could probably take one of those pesticide sprayers like we saw in the coil cleaner video and put a little bit of water in there and just pump it up with some pressure and spray a little bit of water under pressure and probably clean it just as good. And you wouldn't have to keep buying those $30 bottles. But you need to make sure there's something underneath to catch or any moisture that's sprayed underneath there. But that's how you clean a condenser coil. Um, with a brush or with uh, some cleaners. So here we got some samples of condenser coils. So this is a clean condenser coil here on the left and what it looked like when it was dirty. These are the flat ones that you might see. Here's another one. And if you look at this, I'll zoom in a little bit. Look at all that. That's a lot of dog or cat hair and then dirt and dust that gets trapped on top of it. 
And once it gets that dirty, it does not release the heat from the condenser. This could create sealed system problems as well. So if you look here, this is outside. What do you think caused this much dust on the unit outside? Uh, pollen? Storm? How about next to the customer's dryer vent? I've had, I've seen like a wall unit close to a customer's dryer vent and it sucked the lint in and you couldn't see it from outside on a, on a wall unit because the, the air flows from inside out over the coils. You had to take it apart, but the coils were just completely covered with lint from your dryer. And that almost looks like dryer lint, like maybe the dryer vent might be right here on the wall and blowing out. And when the air conditioner is running, all the lint that blows out gets sucked right onto the coils. So if that happens, you want to probably take that dryer vent, even though it comes right out the wall, and run a hose another six to eight feet away and let it vent way away from your air conditioning unit. Otherwise, this is going to kill your system. So that's the end of today. But one of the points I wanted to get to, the most important part, was that if you have a dirty coil, if you have a refrigerator that's not defrosting and the evaporator is covered in ice, your pressures will seem different and you'll have icing up on your suction line. Can Rich get muted again? Don't tell me I'm muted again. I think so. Yeah, but it says that it said that Juan's account is the one that muted him. Yeah. So. Who muted me? There was a there was like a disclaimer that said I think it was Juan's account somehow. So yeah, Juan, it said Fisher Toy muted Richard Zilker. So Juan, stop muting me. Yeah, no. So I didn't though. Okay, That's the thing. let's let's just finish. I so, joined so the chat. Juan, stop. Let let's finish this. So let's let's continue this. That with a dirty evaporator coil, that could cause a suction line to freeze up. In a refrigerator, you very rarely see dirty evaporator coils on residential units. You can see it on commercial units like reach-in refrigerators and and refrigerators and kitchens and stuff like that. But what's going to happen is if the unit is not defrosting, the evaporator, instead of having dirt over it like this, could it be covered in ice. And if the evaporator is covered in ice, then you're not going to get enough heat over that evaporator coil, and it's going to give you the same frozen suction line that a dirty evaporator would. So don't assume right away that my suction line is freezing, someone overcharged this unit. But it is something to look for. So we need to check electrical components and circuitry first. If I saw a frozen evaporator and a frozen suction line, what I want to do is I want to go ahead and defrost and see if that defrost heater is working and the defrost timer is working. The other thing is an overcharge, the evaporator wouldn't be frozen like a, like a no defrost problem. You'll have a little bit more excessive ice on your evaporator as it's turning liquid into vapor, but the evaporator is not going to look like a frozen evaporator from a defrost system. So if you have a frozen suction line, you want to check the evaporator and look at the frost pattern on it. If it's solid frost, we got a defrost problem. The suction line, don't worry about it to you correct your defrost problem. If it's a frozen suction line, and the evaporator has a somewhat normal frost pattern on it, it may be that the unit was overcharged. So these are the things that I want you to look at. And this is why I wanted to like tie in what are the different problems we have with airflow over these coils. And whether it's a residential or commercial, these systems operate the same way. Maybe a little different pressures, maybe a little different gas, maybe a rotary versus a reciprocating or a scroll compressor but they are still a compressor pumping free on a round through a system. So that's the end of tonight's class, everyone.